there's Dorcas mm -hmm. and Mary, and there's Jim Hudson and Don Price. And as I say, Judy Mitchell's coming on. Carol Wood should be coming on. This is fantastic. You see, it get flooded out. In, Where's in the home? avocados? I want the avocado picture back. <laughs> oh, yeah, that was great. <laughs> And I was going to say, don't worry about your knee being replaced. I've had two hips, a knee, and a shoulder replaced. Oh, dear. I'm now waiting for the second shoulder. Well, you're a bionic oh. woman. Oh, yeah. my goodness. <laughs> Betty. Yeah. Hi, that's going to be my line. That's, gonna, that's great. Good it's a, that so, friend, um, all of this, all of this is our artist. major in the Full Employment Act for the medical community. <laughs> <laughs> Well, John, have you finished your week of, tra of celebrating that right. price? Oh, yeah. But I was just going to say, I just had my cataract operation, and that was wonderful. Very oh, wonderful. fabulous. Well, I, I just, think that's the best surgery on the planet, the it cataract. Is, really, it's, it's, it's a miracle. I agree. The results. You have, you have, the world how many have like had cataract like surgery? How many have had cataract surgery? <laughs> yeah. Uh, everybody. Has gone. As a result, we can see you very well. No, that's, <laughs> as a result of his or ours. I, I, I don't know whether that's a blessing or not. But, <laughs> but I had a very nice birthday week. When was your birthday? About the 2nd of December. Most of you are older than I am, right? Yes. When he reached 90, I did. If the candles cost more than the cake here 90. <laughs> <laughs> I've got some of the cake in the freezer. What I'm, do you have coming up that we don't know about, Don? My, my 91st birthday. Yeah, how does everybody feel about being 90? Does it seem like, I mean, to me, 90, I, I love being 80 something, yeah. but 90 seems really old. It's not better than being dead. It's true. <laughs> oh, oh, it's true. Considering the alternative, 90 is not bad. That's you true. know what I love? Is, is Bill turned 90 in October and we walk on the bike path here in Kauai. And a lot of tourists and they'll see him walking a little slowly saying, oh, you're doing great. You're doing great. And I said, yeah, can you believe he's 90? Oh my God, I thought he was about 80. <laughs> uh, 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 uh. As if that's better. <laughs> no. I told all my me and my brother's progeny that they I hope they all become 90, but they have to be terribly patient. <laughs> <laughs> it takes a long time. <laughs> yeah, it does, it really does. <laughs> Maybe we'll all make a hundred. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. Wouldn't Let's that go. be wonderful? Yeah. I think we should plan on it. I only want to be a hundred if I can keep on dancing. I don't think I. Oh, 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 oh. good luck. Yes. <laughs> We're all right with you. So right. she's dancing now, so she should be able to continue. Yeah. I'm taking a cruise to Hawaii, perhaps if it's not canceled for the fifth time. My daughter's coming along as a chaperone. <laughs> Were you in the Navy, Don? No, no, thank goodness. No, but, well, why do you say that? Hmm? Well, I mean, you had to be in the service. Well, I, was, I was in the Army, and I was able to serve only 21 months. So that was nice. Yeah. Well, I had to serve over three years in the Navy, but it was worth it because if I hadn't have done that, I would have had to go in the Army, and I knew the food was a lot better in the Navy. <laughs> well, I, I was in Berlin, and I had a, as a private, but I had a food allowance, so I could eat wherever I pleased. Oh, that was how, very oh nice. And how about the German beer? Was that in there oh, too? Yeah, I think by that time I learned to drink beer. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Uh, now I've I've got to reveal a fact that um, Dick and I were both at a uh, wedding in Bakersfield um, in a, in September, yeah, and um, one of one of the events was uh, the dance program. And they started out with everybody at the reception dancing. <laughs> and uh, every two or three minutes, they were saying, okay, everybody married less than 10 years leave. Ah. Then uh, everybody less than 20 uh -huh. and on up. 
And when they got to 60, there were only two couples on the floor, <laughs> Mark and I and Dick and Lynn. <laughs> <laughs> as, as you took the prize, I have to admit. Well, I've always had the prize. I was there with Marge. Oh, <laughs> oh, oh, great. Uh, what a line. <laughs> Savor it, Marge. That was a good yeah. hey, you're very <laughs> well trained. Good dinner tonight, Terry. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> or, or are you going to Rosati's again for dinner? <laughs> no, but that would be neat. I, I, it's too cold. Gosh, I'd love to go there again. How many of you went to the uh, reunion on campus in October? It was wonderful. No, we we, we had uh, the the best companion for the dinner on the quad that you can imagine. Patty saved us a seat. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, good. Uh, uh, it was yeah. wonderful weather, though. That was just fantastic. Well, they'd had the dinner on the quad and barbecues or whatever they call them uh, all around the place. And it was very, very nice. Wasn't that the atmospheric river the next day? Yes. Uh, yeah. yes. Wow. Next day. Yeah. You were lucky. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. I'm sorry to miss that, but uh, Lynn and I were in Sicily. Oh, too on, bad. On a walking trip. And oh, that's it was too bad. Uh, nice weather. We didn't have three inches of rain. You know, two three miles in the daytime and have a picnic lunch and it's all that. But how many people were on the trip with you, Dick? Well, it was a very small group. We only had ten people, plus the tour leader, and we went up to Mount Etna hoping to see it blow its top or something. But <laughs> oh, it it, uh, it wasn't. It was just like here today, cold. Yeah, yeah. cold. Yeah. But, well, I feel sorry for you all. It's snowing where I am. Oh, we have no snow in in Ogden, and the, we've had no snow. This is the first drop, and we have about I think I have four inches in my is yard. Pull <laughs> out your windows. Is that real or is that a scene? That's real. Yeah, can it's you see beautiful. that? Yeah, yeah. 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 Oh. Get your skis. That storm that you were talking about, that atmospheric uh, river, I guess, Mary, is that right? Atmospheric yeah. river. That big storm brought or didn't really end the drought here in around Sonoma. But what it did for us was it brought 14 inches of rain and filled the creeks and the salmon have been able to come up and spawn. Oh, yeah. Well, that's great. Oh, oh, great. Yeah. oh nice. Oh. Yeah, so we're really, everybody's so happy about that. Yeah. And uh, so that's a cause for celebration around here for that rain. And one of my friends who works for the Ecology Center said it went, the, the stream in some places went from zero to 14 feet in some of the deep holes in the stream. Right. And Oh, they were scary. out there counting all the, the king salmon and the co-hosts. It was just wonderful. Bill, and um, uh, how's everything in uh, Kauai? Yeah. A lot of rain. Yes. Oh, we, 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 we got the California uh, storm. But uh, it's, it's right now it's sunny, thank goodness. Oh. Uh, the, no, uh, the, a lot of flash flood warnings and all that sort of thing. The storm started out on a big island and then to Oahu, and they had like 10 and 12 inches an hour, and houses did slide down. There was, there was damage there, and there was very high winds. It was not so bad here in Kauai. I have a cousin in Honolulu and one in Hilo, and I wrote to both of them asking if they were okay, and they both said they were fine. One in Hilo said, oh yeah, it was just rain. <laughs> <laughs> they get so much rain in Hilo anyway. Yeah. <laughs> She's undaunted by any amount of rain. But, um, excuse me? Out, up in Mauna Kea Mountain, they had lots of snow. Oh, yeah. There yes. was about yeah. 12 yeah. inches of snow up in Beautiful. Mauna Kea Mountain. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Would, that would be gorgeous to go see. Yeah. I see from the uh, latest issue of Stanford Magazine an ad for your latest book. Are you... Are you back to work on the next one? Oh, I don't know. Bet enough for a while. Well, Betty, are you uh, glad that you uh, were uh, uh, reporting uh, for Channel Two when you didn't need a uh, bodyguard? That uh, risked. Oh my! 
And that's really frightening what is happening to news crews yeah. uh, all over. And what's happened in Oakland and San Francisco is just terrible. Yeah. Uh, I and don't that, know whether it, everybody on, on the, on the yeah, Zoom that, knows that there was a uh, bodyguard for a uh, KRON TV yeah. news, news uh, reporter who was actually shot and killed uh, here within yeah. two or three weeks. In Oakland. Yeah. In Oakland. Yeah. yeah. It's very, very scary. And uh, Craig and I, of course, both worked uh, for Channel 2 for many, many years. He worked, was there longer than I was even. And we both talked, you know, about where we, we were in the ghetto a lot. And because there were, there were a lot of stories to do about drug stuff. <laughs> but we never really felt in danger. I mean, there were a couple of times when he had bottles thrown at us and people would yell at us, but there wasn't really any feeling. Maybe it was our fault. We, we didn't, I, nobody really felt in danger, but I, but that has all changed now because it's very serious out there. Guns. Yeah. You, guns. Too many. Yeah, too many guns, guns. everywhere. Yeah. Mm. yeah. People get guns to protect them against the people who have guns. Yeah, yeah Jim, what do you think about that? They're uh, charging the parents with uh, manslaughter. They not, only, they not only bought him the gun, but when they were called into the school and had a meeting with the school principal and the school principal says, you know, this kid is disturbed. I think you ought to take him home for a couple of days. They say, oh, no, 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 no. He's okay. Right. So he just don't get caught. Back. Yeah, just goes don't get caught. caught. Yeah, like MOL, don't, don't, don't get caught. Don't get caught. Right. Judy, is there a problem in uh, Utah, the same thing? I don't think it's as severe, but there certainly are lots of gun deaths that you think could have been avoided. Um, but I don't think... Um, I don't think it compares with what happened in Oakland or anything like that. I mean, there are individual cases that are pretty awful, of course. Can many of you remember interesting stories about Pearl Harbor Day? Which Does anybody remember? remember what they were doing yes. on Sunday morning, December 7, yes. 41? Yes. Now, where, where you were and what you were doing, Dorothy? Oh, yeah. I, I remember. I'll, I'll go. Uh, I was with my mother. We were... We were up on Hollywood Boulevard. We lived in Hollywood at the time. And we were holding hands as we started to go across the street. And they had uh, newsboys in the, in the main streets. And the newsboy was calling, extra, 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 read all about it. Japs bomb Pearl Harbor. <laughs> extra, 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 read all about it. Japs bomb Pearl Harbor. And my mother, I could feel her just go cold because... She had family who lived around Pearl Harbor, and she, I could, I could feel her emotions right through her hand. She went over and bought a newspaper from the, the the news kid, and we went to the sidewalk, and she read, and it was just really, just draining was where we were. And I will never forget that moment, yeah. and the the emotion that was transmitted through her hand, holding my oh, hand. Oh yeah. Yeah. We, had, we had the same thing. I was uh, growing up in Waukegan, Illinois, and the newsboys came out into the neighborhoods, mm. and he was on the corner saying, yeah. extra, extra, read all about it, yeah. Japs have bombed Pearl Harbor, and it was right outside our door. So, yeah. It, it's an scary. interesting thing about memory, because at the time it happened, we heard about it, but we didn't know the, the importance of it, really. Did we? I mean, so much happened thereafter, but we all remember that day. I think maybe a lot of people didn't know where Pearl Harbor was. Well, right. <laughs> <laughs> well, did they? You listen, know? To Bill's, listen to Bill's story. Well, we, we were coming. We, we were coming home from church, and and I can remember. Looking out at the uh, ocean, it was so beautiful, peaceful. Uh, the palm trees were slowly blowing back and forth, and we ca we came to the, our house and, uh, and uh, turned on the radio, and he said, "We're under attack. This is no drill. We are going to go off the air." Ooh. So I immediately ran outside to see all of the action that was going on in uh, Pearl Harbor 
and my mother screamed <laughs> for me to get in the, the house and caused me to get under under the bed. <laughs> and I finally decided, <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, because of the bombs, that was the idea. <laughs> And then finally I said, I'm not going to let any Japanese people land here. So I got my BB gun and went down to the beach to see if anybody was invading Kauai. You got so your that's BB my gun. Thrill Harbor story. <laughs> that's great. You're going to get those guys. Well, the, the aftermath of that, you know, when they did the, uh, when they, they, they put them all in concentration camps, my brother's best friend was a year older than I was. Uh, was taken. He and his family, Shigeru Oki and his family were taken away just rapidly one day. We went out to their house and looked at what was left and, you know, everything was ransacked and terrible, like they'd just been just uprooted. And I've wondered ever since what happened to Shigeru Oki. Uh, yeah. I don't know that there's any way to find out. Actually, <laughs> Betty Ann, depending on what he what he can't be was the irony about family was taken to. Is round of, is it, if, for example, he went to Manzanar, right. uh, there's records at Manzanar that uh, are available to members of the public visiting, uh, who can you can check through and find out what happened to them. Yeah. You can if you can spell his name, you can Google it and see what happens. Yeah. Well, we, so we, on, we, on, on the other end of that, I'm, I had an uncle in. Uh, uh, the Philippines, and he was picked up um, about the time of the death march and um, <coughs> marched to a, a concentration camp. Is he at Los Banos? Uh, Santa, Santa Tomas. Santa Tomas. And um, uh, he had been in the army earlier, but had uh, fulfilled his, uh, his hitch in the army several years before they picked him up. But um, he was one of the fortunate 200 or so uh, that came home on the Grips home uh, in late oh. in uh, uh, 1943. He was six feet tall, weighed 121 pounds, Oof. and he had three teeth left. Oh, and uh, he was, um, uh, I'm guessing he was probably in his late 20s at the time. In 1943, how would that? I didn't know anybody was liberated by then. I there was, it was an ex the grip zone red had an exchange. Uh, I thought it was earlier than that, Terry. But they 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 brought home a bunch of uh, people who had uh, been on uh, with the embassy in Tokyo and uh, elsewhere, and they traded them for for Japanese uh, corresponding Japanese people. Hmm. Well, that's it. Do any of you remember Bob Linderfelt, who was at Stanford? He was a uh, he was in law school for uh, one year, I think when we were maybe sophomores, and then he was a history major getting his master's degree. He's I read he was blind, yeah. and he had a, a, a golden lab as a seeing eye dog. And he used to be, he was legendary, I thought, around campus because he would run with his dog, Nipper. Uh, Bob didn't believe in moving carefully just because he couldn't see where he was going. So he just went full steam ahead. Uh, but he was on the Bataan Death March also, but he was in concentration camp for like five years. Yeah, how he lost, his, lost his vision? Yeah. Lo lost his vision, lost his hair, lost most of his hearing, um, was totally emaciated when he got back. And then he, he um, through the GI Bill, after he recovered, he enrolled at Stanford at to go to law school and then he ended up marrying the secretary at the law school betty so <laughs> they were a wonderful couple i i knew them the rest of their lives i mean we just oh. <laughs> do any of you remember reva feldman yes probably yes. okay she grew up in santa tomas interned in santa tomas with his her sister and her mother and father and uh, they were british subjects her, her father worked for standard oil of something or other i don't know but anyway uh, the day before they were liberated um her father by then he was a very tall man and he weighed about 80 pounds there was nothing left of him and they were sent out to uh, to dig their graves 
and uh, they were liberated. The soldiers came in, the U.S. soldiers came in that day. But anyway, she spent her, you know, growing up years at Planet Moss. May I say something else about Pearl Harbor Day? I remember very, my father was a, a Republican because he was a banker. And that's sort of understandable at the time. <laughs> but we all respected that speech so much the day of Pearl Harbor. We all came in and listened to it. And my father kind of led in that. I thought that was, uh, it's not like today. <laughs> not no, like no. today. I have a memory of that, those early days and, and of the internment camps. Um, I used to walk home from school every day. We lived in the Haight-Ashbury. And I walked by my grandma and grandpa um, had a sausage factory. It was called the pork store. And any of you wander the Haight-Ashbury, it's still there today. It's yes. a restaurant now. But I know was, that restaurant, sure. It, it was a sausage factory then. That's so awesome, um, I, I, walk, I just walked by every, hi, um, we called them Ma and Pa. Hi, Ma, hi, Pa, you know, I'd come in. And next door, was always, I thought it was intriguing, but I just remember looking at it, beautiful Japanese brocade hangings like draperies and fabric in the window. It was like mm -hmm. um, a little indented store walk and then you had the, the store windows that you could see the, the display. And I stopped cold and looked because from the day before, all the windows had been covered with paper hanging in front of what used to be all the beautiful fabrics and draperies. And so I was a little girl, I was only eight, eight, nine years old. And so I went in and Ma, Ma, why, what happened? Where are the people gone? Why is there paper in the window? And she said, hush, 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 Grayley, don't talk about it. They're Japanese, they took them away, we don't know where. But she said, you be quiet. We don't talk. We don't ask anything because they may take us away too. Oh, oh my. They both had German oh accents. Oh. And I've never forgotten that. Oh. I looked strangely at her and I couldn't imagine why. I didn't have a German accent. I didn't understand any of that. But I do remember the words and remember, you know, long afterwards understanding, wow, everybody had their different impact their different yeah. thoughts. Yeah. My parents had a grocery store in the same neighborhood. My mother, they're both immigrants, but she spoke with no accent. My father, German accent, and he became very quiet. He was kind of quiet anyway. He was an artist, but she became the spokesman for everything. And that was sort of, I grew up, you get used to those things, but later you remember this, somebody saying, my grandma said, they may take us too. Be quiet. Right. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Mm. Wow. In, in our county, uh, several Japanese families who were taken. The the people who had employed them or been their customers took care of their businesses for them while they were gone. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, that, we read we've read about that. Yeah. Yeah. They actually did, and the, my mother in law's gardener. Shigeru Inoue was one of those taken, and she made sure that his house and everything stayed the same, and his family was mm -hmm. taken with him, of course, but everything was taken care of. And I think that's beautiful, but I also think that was pretty unusual, because yeah. I've had more stories about when the Japanese, when <laughs> people came in like a bunch of locusts and took everything. Yeah. No, we even yeah, had a Japanese that. grocery store uh, yeah. in... Uh, My Washington. story about Pearl Harbor Day, we lived out near the beach in San Francisco, and me and my siblings walked down to the <laughs> beach to see the action. So like you, Bill. Wow. And there wasn't any action. <laughs> when they started having the blackouts in the heavy <laughs> fog, it was as black as black could be outside. It was quite remarkable when the sun moon wasn't shining. The fog was so thick. Kind of a night. lot of the um, Japanese people were sent from California into Utah. And when I grew up, Mr. Hayashi worked for my dad and mother and he did, he cooked for us oh. and, uh, and gardened. And um, after the war, you know, he kept sending mother and dad 
um, another notice that his mother had found him a wife oh. and he finally did marry. But anyway, during those years, Mr. Hayashi lived with us and, and such a nice man. <laughs> and Yuki, uh, a nice Japanese lady, lived with my grandparents and took care of them during those war years. So oh. California's loss was our gain at that time. <laughs> right. Something that affected all of us. And that was the rationing. Oh, my God. Oh, yeah. I, I, I was in the war uh, the whole, full, say, four years with basically one pair of shoes. Yeah. yeah. You couldn't get shoes. And so I had to, had to, every night I had to polish my shoes. And, uh, you know. And hope your feet didn't was, grow. <laughs> well, That's I, right. Yeah. Well, no, I won't say it was the same a pair of shoes, but I only had one pair, and it had to be polished every night for school the next day. And you know, to say nothing of the the gasoline and the sugar and the uh, uh, the meat. Meat. Mm -hmm. you can... Remember the rationing books? The ration oh, books. Yes. Yes. Oh, I still my have meat. some that my mother. The last ones that we got, my mother saved them. Oh yeah. my gosh! And uh, uh, butter. We. That's how we both. My parents with the grocery store and Ma and Pa with the, the sausage factory, we had to, or the meat store, we had to sit around the dining room table every weekend, every Sunday. We would all gather and bring in all the cans and cans of the little stamps, and they all had to be placed into books so they could be yeah. turned in so they could get new allotments. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and you remember the white margarine, and you got a packet of yellow stuff. Yes. Yeah, make the yellow stuff into the white bar. That was my job was to mix that. Yeah. Does anybody remember the shortage of bubble gum during the war? Bubble gum. And during the war, we were at that point living on the farm. So we didn't have any problem with meat or vegetables or food or anything. And because farm uh, cars or vehicles were allotted more gasoline. There wasn't really any any problem for my family that I can recall about going anywhere even. And my father had a couple of liquor stores, so he would get boxes of bubble bubble gum. My memory is that I was across the street from our house. Sometimes did on Sunday mornings, and I was playing Monopoly with a friend of mine who was a year older than I was. When, and we were in the room next to the, where they had a radio going and music going. They interrupted the music, the news of the war. But later that day, being a Sunday, uh, Jack Benny's program was on Sunday evening. And uh, it's the only time in my life that I have ever been to a radio broadcast or television broadcast. But the people in whose house I was playing Monopoly had tickets to the Jack Benny program that night. Oh my. Oh. Which was in the studio, uh, I can't remember what CBS or NBC, but the studio was over in Hollywood. And we went over there, you know, listened to the program, walked out on the street after the program, and there were searchlights all over the place. <laughs> and every time you heard an airplane, People were looking up and wondering, oh, is that a Japanese airplane or an American airplane or a civilian airplane or a military airplane? All kinds of wondering was going on. Of course, the Japanese aircraft carriers never got close to the U.S. coast, but there was a couple of episodes, one off the coast of uh, Ventura, Santa Barbara, yes, Alita, yeah. where they did a shelling, mm -hmm. and there was another episode up near Eureka where they actually <laughs> sunk uh, a, a ship that was southbound from uh, Portland or Seattle. Uh, you can go to the Marit Little Maritime Museum in Eureka. You can find out about all the details of the latter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I have to just tell you about this shrapnel because my husband, Gene, was living that was an oil lease there at Goleta. And we have hanging on his office wall some of the shrapnel from that. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh. Here in Kauai, in, there were, were Japanese ships, and they actually sunk 
a shipload of, was it people leaving the big island to get us away from it? They actually sunk it. And a Japanese submarine went into the harbor here in Kauai and shelled the shoreline. Ah. So that was with what, in 24 hours? Yeah. Oh, no, a little later. A little later. And, and then yeah. one Japanese pilot on the way back to his ship. I uh, had engine trouble, so he landed in the little island of Niihau. Uh, Niihau. Oh, yeah. And the people heard me. They didn't know what it was. They didn't know anything about it. There was no communication. Uh, and they even threw a luau for him. <laughs> and oh. the word came back well, as to who and what he really was. <laughs> he, he actually and tried to raise... a man raise... and his wife took a... One, the wife took a rock and and pounded. He the Japanese guy shot at a Hawaiian man coming toward him. Uh -huh. Got him a couple times in the leg. And the wife was so angry she got a big rock and pounded on his head. <laughs> no, it's because the bullets got very close to his genitalia. Uh, his his uh, <laughs> manly manly parts. She got so angry. So she said, "That's enough." <laughs> there was a there was a book I'm written. Smash yeah. this guy's head off. You can probably <laughs> probably right. give us the, the title and the author, but there was there was a book written by a man who later became a uh, justice of the Hawaii Supreme Court. His first name was Burton. I can't think of his last name. Uh, who was in the National Guard at the time, and he wrote a little book about the recapture of Nihihau. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, which the they they were the National Guard was concerned that the. Japanese uh, airmen, which had made a forced landing on Nia, would try to raise the natives uh, uh, against the Howleys. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Well, apparently the Japanese had told them if you have any, any problem flying back to the carriers, this is an isolated island that's unoccupied, and so that's apparently how he ended up on Nia, except it had a few hundred Hawaiians living yeah. there. But Bill remembers the military coming, and he remembers guys with machine guns uh, uh, patrolling the streets. Uh, they had blackouts. Uh, but, that, but that, for me, was the wonderful part. All these uh, what, yeah. red, red guys that came from the mainland. I was their gopher boy. Yes, you you wrote about that in your first memoir, Bill. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I did. And oh, that was that was oh, really. You read my book. Huh? Oh, I've read yeah, them all. Oh, yes. They're wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And yeah. Brought, I really like the thing that I asked. I love the piece about you sneaking out <laughs> after uh, curfew and, and uh, uh, taking smokes and stuff like that to the uh, guys who were manning foxholes as part of the uh, Defense Force of uh, uh, Hawaii. The uh, that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun. I mean, I mean, the guys that came from the mainland were just great fellows. I just, uh, I loved them. Just uh, had uh, learned how to shoot dice. Uh, <laughs> I learned a few other vices uh, <laughs> that you shouldn't learn. But uh, I, I mean, the mainland really, mainland guys really changed my life in a way. Well, they changed your family's life too, didn't they? To do a lot of patronizing of the theater. Movie house? Oh yeah, I made it. The, the movie house. His father made it pay off the mortgage and went two years a year. <laughs> when when uh, <laughs> my father built this theater in a thousand seat theater, largest on uh, the islands, in 1939, and by July of uh, 1941, he told my mother, "I'm going in broke. I'm going. To, we're going to have to file bankruptcy." Uh, and, what did happen was uh, there was a foreclosure that got started, but when the bombs came, martial law became part of the islands. And all these civil proceedings ended. And then about, oh, three months later, they descended on the island something like 25,000 soldiers. And where were they going to go for entertainment? <laughs> Other than the bars. Wonderful, wonderful. I have to say, <laughs> I have to say something to both, to both Bill and Betty Ann. Um, Bill, I've read all your books now. And um, I, I really have to say, they're very good. I like the histories. But when it comes right down to it, when you write 
from the heart. And when you write about yourself and your memories, those are the absolute I, I just can't put words to it. They're the very, very best. And Betty Ann, the same with you. Your book, when you tell how you feel and how you react, it, uh, it's absolutely, it, really, both of those books have changed my life, my perception of people, my understanding of my own time, yeah. my understanding of you. Um, and I just want to thank both of you for sharing, opening your hearts and allowing other people in. Oh, and thank you, thank you, Marge. And thank encouraging anybody else who has that idea of writing, write about what you remember and yourself because it it's just very, very meaningful. Thank you, thank you, Marge. I think I think it's important for us all to write. I wrote for my kids. I did not write those stories for you, Marge. Nothing personal, but you know, 20 years after I wrote the stories, then I decided to publish it because I was didn't have anything to do except you know in COVID. So there you have it. Um, but I would not have written that you know as openly. So I think when you write your life stories, everybody write to your kids or to your your partner or to somebody you care about. Tell your stories to somebody you love and trust. Yeah. And then, and then you'll tell better stories. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Marge has written um, stories of both her father and her mother. And her mother's book has 18 chapters. Uh, only the first nine can be published because we're going to have to wait for all of the descendants of the people that <laughs> wrote about them. <laughs> die before before she can really publish it. Right. Someday you're going to see a movie about it, but not okay. during my lifetime. Wow. All right. Oh, Marge, <laughs> you're wetting our appetites for the reading <laughs> the nine later chapters. There are blains all over the place, are there? That we don't know about? We not blains, honey, oh. <laughs> honey What keys. was your what was your last name? My maiden name was Hunneke, H-U-N-E-K-E. -E. My father, I've told you, uh, I think I've mentioned it before. He was a stained glass artist. He made, uh, what did we say, 1,100 windows, stained glass windows wow. in more than 80 churches. And we have a fabulous website that Terry has photographed all those windows. And we've had somebody do a website. It's just absolutely fantastic. So, um, yeah, that that's what he did. How can we see the website? It, it's called um, Hunnicky Stained Glass. So you wow. should write it down because you what won't remember. What a heritage. What a heritage. Mm -hmm. H-U-N-E-K-E Stained Glass dot Glass. com. And you'll see if the, the, the opening picture is just blows you away. And then of course you can explore it indefinitely. It's a very enormous website with all kinds of uh, in-depth information, including all the contracts handwritten way wow. back in those days. So enough of that. Yeah. And he never got to see it, I suppose. He, he never got to see it. No, he was a very modest man. He was one of the German immigrants who had a heavy accent. So he kept, he kept his mouth shut during the war, but, um, he he didn't he wouldn't he didn't even know I wrote a book about him no no nothing of that mm -hmm. he he was very modest he he would have said we, Terry I laugh when you and I talk about this I should do that I should do this he would have said oh, too much too much too much they did it they did there's one problem with the uh, copies of the contracts from uh -huh. the forty years that he was in business. I, he only used one sheet of carbon paper. <laughs> oh my! <laughs> it looks like that sometimes. The carbon copies, you know. Can you remember that of those days? Oh, yeah. oh yes. Oh, it yes. Didn't Marge, was he a was he a, a, a club member? Uh, was this in San Francisco? No. Yeah, yeah. Oh, was he was he a member of the club at the at the moon? They had turned a lot of German immigrants that they weren't citizens during the Second World War. That's not very well known. 
They were also interned in uh, in some places. They yeah. were children. They, um, they picked up, up uh, passports from Italians too and stuff. Yes. Like yes. In fact, they interned some of the Italians at one of the racetracks in San Mateo County. Did they? Yeah. Wow. Mm, that was the Japanese at the other one. Yeah, Tamparan was where the uh, for the Japanese, the temporary housing for the Japanese. Yeah. Oh, and Terry, do you remember? Uh, oh gosh, uh, Georg um, What he was from Austria. Well, Oh, yeah, yeah. Austria was allied with Germany. And well, they were actually had been incorporated into Germany. Yes, exactly. And so when that ship was sunk, those boys, um, when okay. they... Okay, you know, a little background. No, you do yeah. <laughs> make it fast. <laughs> he was uh, one of the pursers on a, a German cruise ship. And um, it, it was caught in the American waters when the war started. And so the Austrians on the ship sunk the ship, opened the, opened the uh, valves to the ocean exactly. and, and sunk. And they were rescued by the Coast Guard and, and were partied in Washington, D.C. as heroes. And um, Finally, they ended up being shipped off to um, L, uh, to uh, California uh, uh, to get them on their way back to Europe via the Pacific. And they got as far as Reno, Nevada, and the Japanese hit Pearl Harbor, and so they became prisoners of war. Okay, uh, there, go on, Marge. Okay, and so they were put into the, the prison on um, Angel Island, you know, in the middle of San Francisco Bay. And there's, they're still there to this day, the old ruins of prisons for uh, people like that, like not criminal, criminals, but people that were held there. So my grandma, this, this same ma that told me, hush, hush, Maggie, don't speak because they might take us too. That same ma had the courage when she found out she was Austrian, not German. She went to the Austrian, uh, uh, what do you call it, embassy, ambassador, and demanded. She heard that these Austrian boys were imprisoned on um, uh, Angel Island, and she wanted to uh, be able to have them be furloughed to her, at least on the weekend, she could feed them a good Austrian meal so they wouldn't starve and they could at least have, okay, so here's this Austrian German with an accent demanding, okay, well, they let her do it. So they gave, they selected a, a man called Georg Matinkovich, and he could be the one representative of these Austrian boys. He would take mail from them, bring it to her. She would take the ferry and meet him. And he was allowed to come to her house so she could feed him an Austrian meal. And then he would go back to the prison. This happened every week during, yep. during the war. Mm -hmm. And so I don't know how long they were there, at least a year or two, whatever the time was. Eventually, they were repatriated back to their own countries, and we kept in touch with Georg. She did, and my mother did then, and I did too, and we kept in touch with Georg Matikovich, and eventually, my mother, my mother after she died, Terry and I went to Germany, and we looked up all these different people, one of and we had kept in touch. One of them was Georg Martinkovich. And so, Austria. pardon me? In Austria. In Austria, right. And by then he was an, an old man. He had just had a leg amputated, probably from diabetes or something. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the reason, but we went there and he said, <clears throat> and I was there with my daughter, the youngest daughter could come and my cousin, his son, they were both teenagers. And Georg, he recalled this whole story and he had all the newspaper clippings to show us still from when the ship was sunk and how they were taken and then they were put in Angel Island. And then my grandma took him, I have many pictures, she took him to Yosemite and showed him all the beautiful sights in California. Mm -hmm. All of this on these furlough weekends that he was allowed 
as a prisoner to come and visit and have an Austrian meal. Interesting. There's your book, March. There's your book. No, I've never heard <laughs> that uh, about those Germans at all. So anyway, he said, here he is in this rest home. He was recovering. And we were there visiting, my husband, Terry and I, my cousin, wife, and his son, and my younger, these teenagers. And he sat in his wheelchair, and he said, I have something for each of you. And he said, but I want you to come each, and they had to come. And he made this presentation to them. And yeah. it was, it was, it was, oh, I have it on. Mm -hmm. It was a smaller version of this coin that I'm wearing. And this is still in, in Austria, you can still buy these, but it's from the Emperor Franz Joseph, their oh. last emperor. And the smaller coin, he had one for each of these children. And he said, I want to give these to you to tell you, even when countries have war with each other, that people can be kind to each other. And your grandma, your great grandma was so kind to me and I want to give these to you as a memory of that. And so, then later, um, as the, they were, they didn't understand all this story, but I've written it for them, so they know it now. There and is your later, as his his wife, um, she sent a coin for each of my grandchildren as they were born, saying, "This is a memory of the man who your grandma was so kind to." and during the time of the war. And I, they each have one of these coins, a smaller version, not this big. Isn't that a nice story? Nice. Oh, yeah. yes. Yes. Very, very <laughs> <heartwarming>. <laughs> That's great to hear. Thank you. Yeah. We have any other stories that people have that would be Can't interesting? Top that one. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose we have passed Thanksgiving, but Christmas is coming. Are there any travel plans for any of you? Judy, do you have any or Nancy? No, no I have this who are coming here, but not, not me going. <laughs> okay, okay. Nancy, how about you? No, my kids are all coming here, or okay. the, most of them are, yeah. Okay. So my mm -hmm. can't make it. Anyway, yeah. Mary, how about you? Oh, we'll stay in San Francisco and go to my daughter's, who has a, the bigger, biggest dining room. Okay. <laughs> okay, so that's another question then. What's your special meal for Christmas? <laughs> How about you, Jim? I have no idea. It, it, Christmas is all up in the air right at the moment. Whether my, uh, my son and I went to Sacramento and had Thanksgiving with my daughter and her husband, <clears throat> but my my daughter and her husband are talking about coming to Menlo Park for Christmas, but they have a dog. Oh, dog does not travel, uh, and they have to find somebody who will take care of the damn dog. <laughs> so, but when you were growing when you were growing up, was there a special meal? Was there something special about Christmas? As Christmas was a repetition of of, uh, of Thanksgiving, except that somewhere my mother's birthday was December 24. Oh, oh dear. Uh, so we did have a, a, a birthday celebration on December 24. <clears throat> and December 24 typically was roast beef and roast beef was accompanied by in the, she would make Yorkshire pudding. She had to make her own birthday celebration, but she, <laughs> uh, Yorkshire pudding in the, in the, in the roasting pan with the sauces that were dripping off from the, uh, from the roast beef. And I developed a real yearning every once in a while for Yorkshire pudding. Every, yeah, I don't know whether anybody else likes that or not. But yeah. Yeah. So, yes. we, yeah. had, we had Yorkshire pudding too. My mother, my grandmother came from England with her family. And every time we had roast beef and that fabulous Yorkshire pudding. Just ah. wonderful. We also had on Christmas morning, we we had we had Sausage rolls from my mother's side and my father's Danish side. We had apfelskeefers. Ah, <laughs> oh, wonderful! Uh, Dick, how about you, Dick Kelson? Well, we're just trying to. Uh, all four of our kids live in California, and some of them real close. But we just lay back and. <laughs> 
let them argue over who's going to do what to take care of us, you know. <laughs> okay, but growing up, was there a special something about your meal or Christmas? Uh, it, it, no, I would say nothing special. It's just that we were, we, we wasn't religious in that sense. I mean, we were Christians, of course, but uh, um, we just, uh, I can't, that one year is pretty much like like the other one. Uh, and, uh, we had turkeys. Yeah. Well, we had turkeys. Well, yeah, I mean, the food, of course, is, food was one, of, except during the war years. And, I don't remember what we did then, but oh. yeah. We yeah. don't we usually don't have turkey on Christmas, so have something else. You have goose? <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Ham, maybe. We've had enchiladas. We've had all kinds of different things. No. Oh. People after they've had it on Thanksgiving, they've said that's enough. Oh. How about you, <laughs> Judy Mitchell? We, oh well, we always um on Christmas Eve, we generally have crack crab. Yeah. Which Wonderful. Oh, wow. <laughs> but guess uh, what? Know, they they, they don't much. have it this year. Yeah. Well, they, they, yeah. it just started. I think yeah. it just started. Yeah. You can it get is, crab that comes from uh, the north, uh, from uh -huh. Eureka. Yeah. Okay. So oh, you have crab, crab, crab and that's the that's the meal. That's the uh, the thing that your family did. Yeah. Okay, now, how guys, about you, Mary? Listen for just a moment. I need to take a picture of the screen, okay, with my camera, because even though we're recording it, I can get a better picture. And but I want each of you to look at your screen, and if your face is only half shown, yeah, there you go. Yeah, very good. Okay, so let me get a good one and smile. I'm going to say one, two, three, and then smile. One, two, three. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that should do it. Thank you. Okay, Mary, how about you? What What is Christmas? Well, we've always had uh, turkey, and we also have it at Thanksgiving at my brother's up in Amador County. But this year, his grandchildren came down with strep, so we the better part of valor was not to go and get those germs. So we had tri-tips. Oh, Ooh, yeah. Because it was last minute, you know, no time to do the turkey. Barbecue tri-tips, a great Thanksgiving dinner. <laughs> Marcus, how about you? Well, uh, Christmas morning has always been, since I was little, my parents always had friends for Christmas morning breakfast. And the menu was ground beef patties with mushrooms. Mm. And uh, she used to do broiled half a grapefruit. But I changed that to a punch, which is orange juice, and you add strawberries and pineapple and bananas to. Ah, so that's our Chris and crumb cake. Okay. Oh, yum! Hey, crumb wow, cake yum. is good. Okay, how about uh, the Fernandez? What do you do Christmas? Well, uh, we, 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 my, my my minder here will will not let me go anywhere. I can't even come and see you in the mainland, my, <laughs> which I'd love to do. But anyway, we, we, we're going to stay home. We're going to have, we we'll probably have a few friends for a thank, uh, Thanksgiving type dinner, meaning uh, turkey and, and, and the fixings, and have a really a quiet uh, Christmas day. Very Sunny, good. I hope. Bill, Sunny will you, will you and, do a. <clears throat> Will you do a Hawaiian chant like you did at my house for Christmas once? Oh, oh yes. Well, I thought, I thought we did. <laughs> oh, yes, definitely. It's okay, Betty, how about you? The powers. Well, we didn't do much when I was growing up because my father had liquor stores and bars, and those were busy times, and he was working all the time, so we didn't do any family stuff. I, I, I But when um, Mary... Uh, Hudson and I both had our kids about the started having children at the same time we started having holidays together and I think more than 20 years we had both Thanksgiving and Christmas together so our kids all grew up uh, over the holidays together and we it was always turkey and the rule was that whoever 
had the the group at her house would do the turkey and then everybody else would bring everything else oh. and, uh, until that turned into mary's uh son-in-law chris who was a superb turkey cooker and so he took over cooking the turkey all the time and um and the kids we we did a draw you know there there were probably what 20 people i mean one night one year there were 35 people for christmas I remember we were living in San Rafael and it was, we took out all the living room furniture to make room, make that a baronial dining room. So we, everybody could sit down at a table and eat. That was crazy. And everybody drew to give a present, you know, um, and the kids who were now then about, I think in their twenties, maybe older, got where some of them were into hot sauce and who could stand the hottest sauce oh, and, it and was I a remember, macho thing <laughs> yes, yes and uh and chris got the hot sauce that one of my sons had put in the christmas draw and so he looked at this and everybody said we we dare you to taste that it's really really hot and he said yeah i can i can handle anything and he just took the cap off that and glunked it down oh. and, uh, as oh. red as Dorcas's sweater is. Horrible. And, <laughs> and tears rolled down his face, but he never admitted that it was too hot for <laughs> us. One of my funniest Christmas memories. Yeah. And then there were just. How about people. you? No space anymore. Don, how about you? Well, I just. Christ. He's going to be on his cruise. You're talking um, about me yet? I Christmas. didn't want to mention the plum pudding that my grandmother makes. Oh, yeah. yeah. And how to make it. It's a short pudding. Right. Oh, I'm excited. Traditional desserts. How about you, Patty? Okay. Our tradition was that we would have chicken pot pies for lunch. Oh. Then my father was from England, so we would have roast beef. We would have uh, plum pudding. Uh. We would have parsnips. We oh. would have boiled onions, oh. and uh, that's our, oh, and of course we had uh, we had the other that goes with it. That Jim is just thinking is so wonderful. Yeah. Anyhow, that's <laughs> us. How about you, Terry? Well, I'll tell you about our thing. Talking about sausage rolls, Patty. Instead of no, our no Yorkshire sausage pudding, rolls. Yorkshire pudding, oh, Yorkshire, Yorkshire pudding. pudding. Yeah. Okay. Um, Every Thanksgiving, uh, I have been barbecuing a turkey and my daughter has been doing a turkey in the, in the oven, preferably stuffed. Well, that left my turkey without stuffing. So I created a, a great cornbread stuffing, but you have to start it a week in advance. <laughs> two, two weeks before Thanksgiving, Marge was sitting in our breakfast room and a great big rat had, ran right over her toe and disappeared under our dishwasher. Well, Marge freaked out, and um, my son-in-law came over with a rat zapper, and the next morning we got the rat. But Marge, was, <laughs> Marge was absolutely sure that the house was infested with rats, so by the end of the week, we had 12 rat traps. <laughs> <laughs> oh, distributed around the house, and I was afraid to get out of bed to go to the bathroom at night. I step into one of those. I'd step in one of those suckers. Yeah, All right. Well, anyway, uh, in the meantime, I started the cornbread stuffing by making the cornbread, and you cut it up into little chunks about three quarters of an inch big, and, and you dry it so it has some consistency. Well, Marge was still in her rat phase. So she made me put it in the oven every night. So there wouldn't be, I, it wouldn't attract any more rats in the house. So I put it in the oven. The next morning, Marge got up, turned the oven on. Oh no, <laughs> no. And by the time I got there to open the door, there was nothing but a two pans of, of little black dice. Oh, no. <laughs> so that meant that I had to get up at seven o'clock on Thanksgiving morning and redo the whole uh, cornbread <laughs> stuffing recipe. <laughs> so, Marge, when you were growing up, what would have been 
Christmas oh. meal. My mother always made carrot pudding and fruit salad. We had a fruit salad. Oh, I wish I could show you the picture because we make it. It's our tradition now and my children's tradition. The fruit salad is in a bowl uh, as big as you, like a huge punch bowl. <clears throat> and it's filled with uh, citrus, all citrus and uh, bananas cut into quarters so that they are completely covered with the, the acidic acid and and uh, grapes cut in half with all the seeds picked out and everybody absolutely Sweet. is addicted to it and it keeps for at least several days so you can make a huge vat and uh, it take because of all the acidic acid it keeps just beautifully but everybody gobbles that up so that's been a long-term tradition but also she made carrot pudding have any of you ever heard of carrot pudding no. Nobody. Terry is the only one. I think it's why he married me. <laughs> he used to make it. And when he is found it, out my family made carrot pudding, it probably sold the deal. Was you it know, steamed? Was it, it was, steamed? It, it was made from raw carrots, raw potatoes, grated in a grater. And then you have flour, sugar, um, uh, you have all kinds of spices. Oh, you have raisins and dried currants and that's all it is. And then it's put into a big, a beautiful mold with a lid on the top and you put it in boiling water and steam it for three yeah. and a half hours. Mm. And, and then you turn it over and shake and it comes out this beautiful mold. And then Terry's grandma and my grandma, the same ma, we she used to make like butter and powdered sugar and whiskey and you blend uh -huh. that like a stiff paste oh hard and then sauce. you could have the hot hard carrot sauce. pudding hard sauce. <laughs> and you hard take sauce. A, a spoonful of hard sauce and it melted and drizzled on this mm. yum we still make that and the kids the granddaughters now make one for terry for his birthday and for christmas Oh, that's oh. Well, we did that with plum pudding. We did that same kind of steaming Very and then the simple. hard sauce. Yeah, yeah. And of yeah. course, I love the hard sauce. I'd yeah. eat that by the spoon. Yeah, I like the hard sauce better than the plum pudding. <laughs> <laughs> we didn't have liquor in ours. Hmm. Now, Nancy, did we skip you? No. What, what, what for desserts are you talking about? No, as a kid growing up. Oh, what well. Been tradition. We pretty much had what everybody else had for for Thanksgiving, I mean, for Christmas. Uh -huh. um, no, it's, uh, yeah, yeah no, it was only, it's only been changed in the last, I don't know, 10 or 15 years. We, we've switched to, uh, well, some people can't eat crab because they're allergic to it, but I mean, we, we have different kind of dishes, you know, like because we usually go down to the beach. So we would take, you know, we would have Christmas at the beach. And so you have different, oh. you know, everybody would have a potluck. Yeah. Something. Yeah. And uh, then we always had a box of C's candy. That was our dessert. <laughs> well, we did. We always had shrimp cocktail too. That was another thing, not crab, but shrimp. My mother did that too. Yeah. yeah. yeah always starting the meal. Right. Yeah. Um, I may be older than a, a lot of you because when I was a kid, um, we lived in Tulare and my grandparents all lived in Fresno, which was 45 miles an hour away. As somebody observed earlier, uh, an hour at the 45 uh, well, mile an hour. speed limit. <laughs> uh, and uh, we, we would pick up a live turkey on the way up oh. on th early Thanksgiving morning. And uh, the first thing that you did was to get the turkey out from the trunk of the car and on a log with a hatchet. Oh, my God. Oh. Oh. Turkey. Oh. But, uh, but, but then the adults would would pick the feathers. Oh, it's up to the kids to do the pin feathers. And there's nothing like standing there for an hour with a pair of tweezers trying to get all the pin feathers out of a turkey. Do, do turkeys run around when they when they've been uh, decapitated like chickens do? I think so. Yeah, I would think well, because when you try to keep them from doing that by tying their legs. Oh, okay. Well, okay. Uh, did, you, <laughs> did you pardon any of them? 
<laughs> Apparently not. They ate him. <laughs> Capital punishment. <laughs> the entree. <laughs> Harry, I have to say, Ma and Pa had the, the meat store, and my mother had a grocery store, and we never had anything as inhumane as that, and I'm almost <laughs> as <good> as you. <laughs> hey, every, every turkey that ever got eaten was treated. Never had it before? <laughs> yeah, but Marge, all the inhumane stuff happened before the, the critters got to the store. True. Yeah. <laughs> no, 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 Thank no, you. No. Now, Marge, Marge has got a story that you've got to hear about her aunt coming from Germany oh, <laughs> and, and doing a turkey for a very oh, my God. family in San Francisco. All right. I'm going to, this is Aunt Martha. I'm going to make this, I don't want these, uh, I'll make this very short. Aunt Martha, who I look like quite a bit. So we have a lot in common, and I have a granddaughter that looks like her too. Anyway. <clears throat> she was the youngest sister from my father, nine children, uh, parent, father dead. Anyway, she came to this country also as an immigrant. And she had no talents, no schooling. So she was hired as a cook and a housemaid for people who lived up on Knob Hill in Terry, what is it? The Brockle Bank. Oh. Yeah. The Brockle Bank, have you heard of it? It's still there. Absolutely. A very elegant, um, you know, fancy apartments and on Knob Hill. And so Where they had maybe a whole the St. Francis Hotel. Right. No, no, no. Up on the top of Knob Hill, Brockle right. Bank. Okay. Anyway, uh, so she the worked for these people. It was an older couple. And so they and she cooked and they loved everything. She cooked German cooking, blah, blah, blah. Germans don't didn't and they didn't then have turkey. They didn't do that. And so when the master, the owner, the man, said, um, "Marta, can you uh, cook a turkey for us? We have guests coming for Thanksgiving." And she she never wanted to say no that she didn't know what he was talking about. She said, "Of, of course, yes, of course, I can cook dinner for your guests and for you." for this, this thing called Thanksgiving, you know. And so she went to the butcher, she ordered a turkey and she got the turkey, the turkey came on Thanksgiving day. It looked beautiful, you know, it wasn't like Terry describes, it was all cleaned and nice and you put it in a pan and you rub butter on it and make it nice. And then you do potatoes and you do, well, what, what good German wouldn't do? Kartoffel and butter and, you know, parsley with this and that and all the vegetables and, and all oh. the baking, all the good things that you go with it. And the turkey got shoved in the oven. And then it was time to serve the people and they were to the table and the, whatever they started the meal with. And then she brought out on the platter for the mister to serve and to carve this beautiful big turkey all browned beautifully, placed it in front of him with the knife and fork. And he carved into the breast or wherever you start with it. And this huge putrid odor came out because she had no idea that you had to clean out the inside <laughs> of the turkey. <laughs> oh, <laughs> no. It was purely putrid. This, all the innards had been cooked and steamed and you can imagine the smell of that. Oh, God, and she and had just, just utterly shocked. She, oh my God, ran into the kitchen crying and they all had to leave. I mean, I don't know what they did. They went out to dinner, maybe they ate dinner. <laughs> but it was just a catastrophe. But I, as a little girl, just a two, three, four, something young, <laughs> I know she came to her brother, to my brother, my father was her brother. And she said, oh my God, my God, they will never take me back. I can't lose my job. He said, stop, stop. People aren't like that. He was the artist that did stained glass windows. You don't worry about this kind of stuff, you know. Anyway, they took her back, of course. They loved her and all that. But she and I have never <laughs> forgotten that. when you well, don't know you've got to clean out a turkey shirt. Sure, it's a disaster. Let me, <laughs> that's a wonderful story, Marge. Let me ask you, how many others have had the experience on either Thanksgiving or Christmas that we had in cooking a turkey? How many what? How many others have had this following experience that we have had okay. 
turkey on either Thanksgiving or Christmas. We dutifully computed <coughs> how long the turkey had been <laughs> in the oven. We put it in the oven, and the prescribed number of hours later, somebody called our attention to the fact that we had not turned the oven. <gasps> <laughs> oh my god i thought you were going to say that it uh, that it wasn't done when you thought it was going to be done oh it certainly wasn't done <laughs> absolutely wasn't done i'm sure you're not alone jim what did you do about the uh, <laughs> we kind of postponed <laughs> dinner and on high. Yeah, that's great. But it's been Stories are getting better and better, seen. but I have to go because I have another thing to do. And so it's been wonderful visiting everybody. I'm just Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Happy Christmas. 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 Happy so we'll join again in the new year, I guess. I hope so. And Bill, are you going to finish us off? <laughs> yeah. With a Christmas blessing. She wants it to sing. A Christmas oh, blessing. You, 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 you want a you want a, a Christmas a Christmas blessing. Yeah. In Hawaiian. <laughs> Hoyo, Stanford, 1953. <laughs> 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 Stanford 1953. Malama Pono 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 <laughs> bye bye, everybody. Thank bye. you. Bye. 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 Merry Christmas. Bye. 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 Merry Christmas, everyone. Bye. 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 Hang up now. Happy, bye -bye. New Happy New Year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye. 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 bye.